right. Does anyone else get triggered by stained glass? Is that, is that just me? <laughs> I asked a couple of our uh, leaders, Ricky, Hannah, they're in their 20s, and they're like, no, it's very vintage. I love it. But for me, I get triggered uh, looking at that. And, and, but maybe it's a, a, the perfect image because some of us grew up with a misunderstanding of God, maybe because of our religious background. And, and when we don't understand who God is, we may not understand who we are. And so... This community is a place where you can come no matter where you may be in your spiritual journey. And we said, you heard John, our pastor, grow pastor, say, you know, we love everyone life by life. Well, the people who help make this so warm and so welcoming on the front lines, at least on Sundays, is our guest services team. They had a big gathering yesterday. I want to show you a picture of them so we can thank them. There they are. Can we thank them? You might recognize some of them. I didn't ask for permission to show that picture, uh, so thank you guys for letting us do that. But yeah, I was super grateful for this team. And, and they create this space. They help create the space. They're on the front lines of a, of a community that allows you to come as you are, with your doubts, with your struggles. But what we're talking about in this series is who I am. What if we could fully understand who God created us to be, who he wants us to be, who he's inviting us to become? What if we could fully understand that? So much would be overcome. Last week, if you missed the message, it really focused in on resting in who God says we are. Looking at Ephesians chapter 1. That's a great chapter in the Bible to read and read again. And if you missed the message, go back and you can watch the, the message our senior pastor shared at gatewaychurch.com or you can... Go and watch what we shared here in the room. Just go to the last newsletter for either the YouTube or Facebook or SoundCloud page. But today we're talking about the evil that attacks us, that tries to distract us from who God says we are. And, and let me explain it this way. We'll use an example from physics. Who loves physics? Like two of us. It's like not, a lot more moans and groans. All right. And notice the people who love physics just raise their hand, right? They're, they're the class, the people who love school, right? But let me just give you an easy one. You'll even know how to finish this. For every action in nature, there is an equal and opposite. Right. It's Newton's third law of motion. So if object A exerts a force on object B, object B also exerts an equal and opposite force on A. Forces result from interaction. So let me give you an example. Say driver B is driving down the road and you're just minding your own business. You're at peace. You're at rest. You're even listening to music that Jesus likes. Like everything is going great. And then all of a sudden, driver B drives right in front of you, cuts you off and honks at you as if it's their, your fault. Now that generates a response what do we do in this situation? You know, I know this is not the exact situation Newton was describing, but in many ways, there's an action that requires some sort of reaction. Do you wave with one finger? Like, what do you do in that moment? <laughs> or do you pause? Before you get triggered, do you pause to consider, maybe this guy's just having a bad day? You know, in moments like that, a, a, a famous quote comes to my mind, be kind, Everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. But that's not usually where our mind goes at first, is it? There is a, a, an, an action that usually causes a reaction. But what if we didn't have to react? What if we could rise above that? What if we can have a good day even when those around us are having a bad day? Too often we give power to people around us. The person who cuts us off, we give them the power to ruin our mood in that moment and maybe even beyond that moment. But when we understand who we are, we can respond to life's challenges and not just react. See, we are made in the image of God. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. And God is for us. It doesn't mean that we do everything we should do or we act the way we should act or we believe everything that we should believe, but we should know that God created you on purpose and with a purpose, and he is 
guiding you back to a relationship with him if you don't have one. Or he's guiding you to a place of even greater intimacy if you do know him. God is always pursuing us. And when we line up to his design for us and walk in obedience towards him, there's nothing that can truly stop us. Listen to this verse in 1 John. By the way, so many of the letters in the New Testament or the books in the Bible are letters written from pastors and, and spiritual fathers to their spiritual kids, to the people that they love. They're just trying to help them learn how to navigate life. So he's writing to them in the midst of all sorts of chaos. He says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. This is a remarkable statement that if we don't give in to the condemnation, the con condemning thoughts in our mind or what others have said about us, and if we remember and realize that God's invitation is to love him and to love others, and if we can just stay focused on that, then we can have confidence before God. And when we do, he abides in us, rests in us. There's a, a sense of God's peace and presence that we can experience all the time, regardless of what's going on around us. Outside forces do not have to get in the way of that confidence. They don't have to get in the way of our obedience, that willingness to love God and love other people. Even when outside forces are attacking us, we have the right, the God-given authority to respond accordingly. So let me say it this way, and this is really the theme of the day. If you don't remember anything else, remember this. Evil opposes us, but God empowers us. To better understand, I, I want to go back to the beginning of the scriptures. God is created mankind, and he gave us freedom in the midst of it. And, and we're going to look right at the story, the part of the story when object B, that evil force, is attacking object A, the first of God's human creation. Now, let me, let me just say this. Some of you may not be triggered by stained glass, but you might be triggered by the book of Genesis. And, and I just want to say out loud that, that this is a beautiful story explaining why we live in such a broken and messed up world. That there's a loving God who created humanity to co-labor, to co-rule with him, and yet he gave us freedom. We're not robots. We're not puppets. He gave us freedom, and in that freedom, we chose to go our own way. And we can get mad at Adam and Eve, because if they hadn't blown it, we'd all still be living in the garden, naked, all this food to eat from. Some of you are like, okay, that's a terrible idea. Don't, that's not what I'm looking for. But this idea of all the brokenness in this world is what they brought to us. But in reality, every single one of us make the same mistakes all the time. We all go our own way. So as we read this, I want you just to listen to it for the, as if it's the first time you're hearing it. And we'll explain it as we go. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the certain serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the, tree was, and, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together 
and made themselves loincloths. Up front, I'm going to tell you that we're going to talk about how we're attacked. And as we can learn through this passage, how God empowers us to withstand these attacks. The enemy of your soul attacks with manipulation, doubt, and greed. First, the enemy attacks with manipulation. That question, did God really say? And so as we come to this passage, and you're, you're reading, it's the first few pages of the Bible, and there's a talking snake. And some of us are reading that and hearing that and thinking, okay, this, all right, you've lost me. It sounds like Aesop's fables. But let's talk about this for a moment, because the Bible is a great interpreter of the Bible. So if you continue to read the story of the scriptures, you, you start to see that there's a spiritual force of evil. And here was the garden where God gave humanity freedom and said, there's one tree, don't eat of it. And yet, before the garden, God had created the spiritual realm, these angels. And a third of the angels, the Bible tells us, rebelled. And one of them was the most beautiful of all, called Lucifer who now shows up in the form of a snake. Now, you may be thinking, I don't believe any of that. I'm skeptical of the spiritual realm. Well, let me ask you this. Have you ever had a diabolical thought that popped into your mind and you couldn't explain where it came from? I believe that's a spiritual force of darkness trying to tempt you, distract you. Now, we can have thoughts, negative thoughts, our own negative thoughts, we can also have thoughts from God. When we start following him, we start to discern those thoughts that are calling us to do something courageous or selfless and still consistent with his character. Those may be thoughts from God. But if we have evil, diabolical thoughts, we need to remember in that moment, wait, that's not who I am. By the way, it's not a sin to be tempted. It's what you do with that temptation that determines the type of person you'll become. And if you were to describe, what does that diabolical thought look like? You might describe it as looking a lot like a serpent. So here's this evil creature that's trying to drive a wedge between God and humanity. And he tempts Eve by saying, did God really say? See, we discovered that this creature is deceptive and crafty. And he uses semantics to try to break down Eve's trust with God. The serpent throws out this erroneous notion that they can't eat any from any tree. And Eve clarifies by quoting God's request of just not eating one tree. They could eat of any tree they wanted except for one. So, of course, human nature is that's the one they were drawn to. Think about it for a moment. Why was she even close to that tree? I don't know about you, but I would like to think that I would be away from that tree, anywhere else but that tree, eaten as much as I wanted, right? Everything sugar-free in the garden. <laughs> but here she was, not only close to that tree, but she starts listening to the serpent. See, the moment Eve begins to explain to the serpent what she heard from God, she was already being deceived. I mean, first off, it's a talking snake. That should be a good enough reason to run the other direction. But instead, she just stays and she listens and she ends up in a conversation with the one who's the enemy of her soul. See, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 tells us what we can do when, when we have thoughts that are pointing us towards manipulation, away from the truth. 1 Thessalonians 5 says this, Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good and reject every kind of evil. When you have a thought that's a little bit off from the truth, I mean, did God really say that? Is that really what God would want in my life? When we start going that direction, immediately... Reject evil. Instead, you can replace evil by rejoicing always, or, or praying continuously, or giving thanks in all circumstances. Because when we do that, we're actually empowering the Spirit of God to speak to us. We're ignoring the evil thought, the dark voice, and replacing it with what's true, with what's good. 
And it says to test them all, test the thoughts that we have, and only hold on to what is good and reject everything that's evil. It says not to treat prophecies with contempt. Now, a prophecy is simply a proclamation of what God says is true. To prophesy on a Sunday could be the proclamation of what God says is true. It's, it's like preaching. But prophecy could also be a, a word of wisdom that maybe someone that cares about you comes to you and says, hey, I was praying about you today and I had this thought. Or, or maybe a dream. And, and they communicate to you on behalf of God. Hey, listen to this dream. It may or may not have anything to do with you. It may or may not resonate. But when we don't want to hear from God, when we don't want to lean into what's true, and we give room for evil, evil will take up all the space we'll give it. Maybe you've experienced that in your life. So if the scheme of the attacker is to manipulate, then we are empowered by God to hold on to what is good and reject every kind of evil. Replace deception with truth by spending time with God in the scriptures. And if you ever come across something in the, in the scriptures that is confusing, more than likely there's probably something happening in the context that just a little bit of a deeper dive will help you with. And it's important to always interpret the scripture with the scripture. Because people have used the Bible for thousands of years for their own devices and manipulated the words to say what they wanted it to say. Instead, we need to come to the scriptures to hear what God has to say to us. And number two, the enemy sows a seed of doubt. He asks, does God really want what's best for you? Another way to put the lie is, is God withholding good from you? God is just a buzzkill. He's trying to get in the way of your having fun. I mean, this tree looks so delicious. See, God had actually given them every tree in the garden to eat and enjoy, but only one tree... And they were told not to go eat of that tree for their own protection. See, the accuser is tempting Eve to question God's character in this. Trying to get her thinking, maybe God isn't as good as I thought he was. He's holding back from me. He's holding out something I want. He's trying to keep her from something better. Now, the reality is, they probably would have come to understand more about good and evil. Had they stayed in communion with God, it would have just been God teaching them more and more. See, when our attacker gives us a seed of doubt, then we are, res we are empowered to respond with confidence. Philippians 1.6 says it this way, Being confident of this, our partnership with God, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. See, what this means is that God created you on purpose and with a purpose. And he is working in you. He's sending people into your life. He's illuminating lyrics of a song, scenes in a movie, opening your eyes when you're reading the scriptures or having a prayer, connecting to you through your thoughts. God is constantly pursuing us, wanting to work in us and through us. So we can have confidence when we have these attacks that cause us to doubt. That we can turn off the phone, turn off the news, get off our social media feeds, and instead turn to God through the scriptures, through prayer, through thanksgiving, through worship. One of the things I love about this community is this is a place where you can come. We say, come as you are. We've also said for years, no perfect people allowed. What that means is you can be honest about where you're at. See, it's not a sin to have doubts. It's how you act according to those doubts. Do you allow doubts to drive a wedge between you and God, or do you allow doubts to remind you, oh, this is right, I need to turn to God? See, God is big enough to take on your doubts, your struggles, your concerns, your fears. Turn to him. Allow him to meet you in those moments. Matthew 7 says it this way, reminding us of God's character. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? We have a God who wants to be your Father, the best Father you could ever imagine, who gives good gifts to us. 
And you may be thinking, well, what, what are the gifts that God has given me? Well, look at this next verse. James 1.17 reminds us, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. See, the God who created you loves you and is there for you. It doesn't mean you won't have problems. In fact, it means that he is with you in the midst of those problems to help you through. But just the fact you have life, you can breathe. You were born at this time in history, this place on this planet. You have people who care about you. Those are all gifts from God that somehow in the midst of temptation, we overlook and we forget. And then the third, the enemy attacks with greed. The enemy asks or says to Eve, he knows your eyes will be open and you will be like God. See, the irony is we were created in God's image. We were already like God. The tragedy here is that we were made to co-rule over the earth, to have dominion over creation. But at the fall, everything was reversed. Death and decay, brokenness, evil, flipped everything upside down. Instead of ruling over creation, now the creation rules over us. We allow the creation to define us rather than our creator. See, there's something broken in us that wants more than what God has for us, which is actually better than we could ever ask or imagine. Too often we come to God with our to-do list, telling him what we need. One of my favorite quotes, Tim Keller said, that God answers our prayers the way we would if we knew everything he knows. we could come to God with an open heart and open mind and just say, God, I don't like what's happening and I need your help. I need your peace and your presence to guide me through this. Help me see the good that you can bring out of this. If we were to come to God with an open heart, open mind, and not just telling God what to do, but asking him to be with us, to help us through it, it would change everything. See, but greed is this insatiable desire to have more than what we already have. And this evil creature that we're reading about in Genesis 3, there's a verse that describes who he was and this greed that was within. It says this in Ezekiel 28. He was part of God's inner circle. It says, to Lucifer, your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So God says, I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. No longer was Lucifer, the accuser, part of God's inner circle. He was no longer as powerful as he once had been. And we can trust that God can bring good even out of the destructive and evil things that the accuser does through the broken hearts of other people. Now I want you to juxtapose our attacker's approach with the way that Jesus responded to all the power that was within him, God in the flesh. Philippians 2 tells us this way. Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of of a servant. It goes on to say, in even dying on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. See, our identity problem is a worship problem. We were made to worship God and reflect like mirrors his beauty to creation. But Lucifer lost sight of this. The accuser lost sight of this. But Jesus, walking among us, held true in spite of being a human being with flesh and blood in a broken world. Now, the word for image is actually the same as idol. We were supposed to be living, breathing representatives of God, his image in the world. But the problem is, instead of going to God to meet our deepest needs, we go to people. We go to things. We turn even God's good gifts into our little gods. Notice what John Calvin said about 
the idols in the human heart. The human heart is an idol factory, churning out new idols like the conveyor belt in a manufacturing plant, rolling out new widgets. Have you ever overcome a struggle only to replace it with what becomes a new struggle? See, until we learn to, to take our hearts to God in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of our great days, we miss out on what God has for us. A good friend of mine had a rough week and, he, and relapsed. And I asked him what caused it. He said something I'll never forget. He said, success. You see, he was doing good. So all of a sudden, I don't need to stay as connected. I don't need to say no anymore. The beauty is, God forgives and lets us restart again and again. See, the enemy tempted Eve to question God's character, that maybe God was withholding something good from her. And so they believed that lie and made the choice to decide for themselves what is good and evil. They didn't fully understand God's character. And and here's the thing about that story, Adam and Eve. Adam was created first, right? So he should have been protecting Eve from that serpent. He should have warned her, get away from that tree. Don't even listen. See, but humanity is intrigued with what we don't have. But when we understand that God is good and he gives us exactly what we need, not necessarily what we want, And he gives it to us just in time, not necessarily when we want it. When we learn to trust God, when the enemy comes after us, instead of looking inward, we need to learn to look upward. See, Eve saw this fruit and it was pleasing to her eye. It looked good, so she took it and ate it. And oftentimes, that's a great way to describe sin, is we see something that's not ours and we try to take it as if what God has already provided for us is not enough. We face these decisions daily, and no matter what we choose, we're being formed and shaped into some sort of image. We believe the lie that money can buy us happiness. And so we become workaholics and neglect our friends and family. Or or we start to believe that sex feels good, therefore it must be good in whatever way I deem it. Or, Or we think to ourselves, you know what, I deserve it, just one more glass of wine. Or I need it. We just convince ourselves. We, we believe that I'm just following my heart as if our heart will lead us in the right direction. I don't know about you, but my heart has led me astray many, many times. We believe the lie that I decide my own truth and I'm going to be true to myself or I'm going to do me and you do you. Unaware or uncaring that in our own selfishness, we're actually hurting not just ourselves, but those that care about us. But I want you to think about all those statement, how, statements, how isolating those are. We're disconnecting from God. We're disconnecting from community. The very things that can help us when we face trials, when we face evil. See, God wants to empower us to overcome. And that's why when evil opposes us with greed, we are empowered to respond with worship. Now, singing is the easiest form of worship. But the scriptures tell us that being a living sacrifice, this is your act of worship. Being willing to lay down your desires and say, God, I trust you, to die to yourself. See, when we worship God, when we become living sacrifices, our our hearts are exposed and we can see things so much more clearly. They're filled with gratitude for the work of Jesus. We are at rest, at peace. See, worship brings humility, uproots what should not be there, and takes our eyes off of ourselves. One of my favorite definitions of gratitude I learned when I was at a church in Los Angeles called Mosaic. The pastor there, Erwin McManus, says, gratitude is being thankful for what you have and not mad about what you don't have. Being thankful for what you have and not mad about what you don't have. And I saw him raising his kids while we lived there, They're now adults serving in the church there. But I I remember he would use this principle, trying to teach them gratitude. Because any time they would ask for something, he would always respond with this question. What do you deserve? And the answer, which they begrudgingly had to say every time before they got what they asked for, was nothing. Dad, can we see a movie? Well, what do you deserve? Ah, 
nothing. Can we please go see a movie? And it could get a little bit annoying for them, but it was great practice to remember. Anything we get to do is a gift. We should be grateful for what we have, not mad about what we don't have. Well, there's a mutual friend of ours named Sebastian that had seen the same thing. And so he decided to use this on his kids. And his son, Sammy, was about five years old. When I was having a conversation with Sebastian, Sammy comes running up and says, Daddy, 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 can I have some candy? And he says, Son, right now I'm talking to Eric. Just a minute. But Daddy, please, 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 can I have some candy? Son, not right now. But Daddy, please, please, can I have some candy? And he finally says, Sammy, what do you deserve? And little five-year-old Sammy looks dejected and looks down and says, death and hell. (laughs) Holy moly. (laughs) I don't recommend that as a teaching strategy with your children. Sure does change perspective, though, doesn't it? That candy does not seem important at all at this point. See, the reality is everything good that we have in this life is a gift from God. If we can learn to be grateful for what we have and not mad about what we don't have and take our deepest needs and desires to him, he will bring healing to us. Let me give you a very practical and yet personal example of this. I've only done this one other time in the 12 years I've been here. I'm going to read from my journal. And then the good news is I'll, I'll not read very much, but I'll also get to a place of, of God responding. And he can do this for each of us. But I've been in a bit of a funk ever since my dad died. I think it triggered, it triggered in me uh, some anxiety and a need to be in control. Uh, My dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and then a few months later diagnosed with cancer. And I found myself reading articles about how to not get Alzheimer's and cancer. And it was literally describing how I often live my life. Avoid stress, make sure you sleep all night, and don't eat sugar. That's literally the three things I don't do very well. And so I found myself just a bit in a funk. And so here, I, yeah, I wrote it this way, October 19th, almost a month ago, Heavenly Father, you're so patient with me. I struggle to sit still, to worship, to pray, to connect with you. Even still, you speak to me. Or a few weeks way, later, I'm still in a funk. Lord, thank you for your goodness and your grace. I've been in a continual funk, perhaps since my dad's decline. I'm not exercising. I'm not sleeping well. I'm eating poorly. I'm spending too much time on my phone. I've even had two people at work tell me that I'm on the phone too much in our meetings at work. I'm in recovery, and I've got an accountability partner, but even still, forgive me. I need you. I need to start afresh today. That was a week ago, November 7th, today. Sadly, once again, I still need a new start. Lord, yesterday I was in a funk, more easily angered, stressed, generally unpleasant to be around, and tempted all day just to be on my phone or watch TV. It's hard to put a finger on why I felt so sad or depressed, but ultimately it's about control. I can't control my sugar or screen addiction. I cannot control when people I love die. I cannot control whether or not I'm going to lose my memory. I can't seem to control my inbox, my calendar, or spending time with you. I cannot get enough time to plan or work on what I want to work on. I'm still so far behind. And then I shifted. Yet every good gift I have is from you. So why do I worry about finances, my health, my kids, and their futures, or what I watch on the news, and other things I cannot control? And then I came to a passage of Scripture, and I'm going to read some of it to you. It was one of those things, I was going to write a verse, because it was exactly what I needed to hear, but, but it just kept going. I think I ended up writing 30 of the 39 verses, because it was exactly what I needed to hear. God spoke to me so clearly this morning of what's true, regardless of how I'm feeling. See, too often we let our feelings overcome our faith. Our feelings are going to lead us astray. Let me just read a few of these. Maybe this will encourage you as much as it did me. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. 
And you, because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. God sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving us his son as a sacrifice for our sins. So that we no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit. It goes on to say, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. And then the author of Romans does this thing that I he does many times, and I love it. He reminds you of who you should be and who we shouldn't be. And then he says, but remember who you are. He says, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature, even though it might feel like it. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And Christ lives within you. So even though the body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal body by the same Spirit living within you. He goes on to say, You have not received a Spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when He adopted you as His own children. And now we call Him Abba, Father. And since we are His children, we are His heirs. What we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory we will experience along with creation when he makes all things right. And then it goes on to say, if God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who will then condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. The Son of God is pleading on your behalf. The Spirit of God, it tells us in this passage, gives us the words when we don't even have the words to say. And I need you to hear this. This is for you if you follow Jesus. And if you don't, I want to invite you to say yes to his love. Surrender your life to follow him. Because here's what it says. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? He's pursuing every one of us, no matter where we're at in this journey. Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity, or we're persecuted, or we're hungry, or we can't stop eating sugar, or turning off our phone, or watching the news, or we're destitute, or in danger, or someone we love dies, or we're threatened with death? Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries for tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Maybe you felt bombarded by your past, by your pain, by your circumstances. Maybe your identity is completely shattered because of it. I want you to know God's plan for you is not to feel overwhelmed by hurt or shame. His desire is that you would overcome by the amount of love he has for you. For you to know that through the darkness of night that he's still with you. That you can turn to him at any time, whether you've followed him for years or this would be the first time. When you can't take another step, he's carrying you. Like a good father, he's holding you saying, baby girl, baby boy, it's gonna be all right.
those thoughts in That's when I start to wonder Where do I fit in Then you remind me That you're holding me down The past is behind me you found me like a ray in the dark on my ugliest days you say you always love me just the same then you remind me you're holding me tight is behind me it'll be are wrapped around you, it'll be all right. While you sleep, I'll take care, I'll watch over you, it'll be all right. I'll take care of your loved ones, it'll be all right. Your future's in my hands, it'll be all right. Your past is forgiven, it'll be all right. Your future is secure. sits closer than a brother, it'll be all right. Sleep now. For when the morning come, my mercies will be new. It'll be all right. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you love us. Who are we that you love us? You gave everything for God, may we entrust our lives to you. Allow you to guide us into who you've created us to be, that we would see who we are in your 
her eyes and not allow the condemnation and the manipulation and the evil thoughts and the darkness distract us. That we would walk fully aware of who we are, created in your image, loved by you, invited to be your children, your heirs. God, for anyone here who has struggles or things that are overwhelming them or temptations that seem to be taking over, God, would you just give each of us the courage to surrender that even now, leaving whatever that is in this room. God, whether it's sticking around to just pray on our own or, or going over to the prayer team, God, we just want to surrender those things that hold us down, that we would believe and live with confidence that you are with us and it'll be all right. We can trust you. The worst that can happen is we end up in your presence eternally. Everything is a bonus between now and then. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Eric and our band for leading us in worship today.